OK, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Yep. Perfect. OK, so I'm going to be talking about the patient level prediction code. But before I actually dive into this, I also wanted to just give a brief uh, overview of what, what the package really does. So this package answers the question, um, can we predict some risk of a future outcome for a target population during some time at risk? So an example of this would be predict the risk of depression in pregnant women during pregnancy. If that's the type of question you're interested in, then the patient health prediction package uh, is the package for you. Uh, and if you're interested in contributing in the patient health prediction, that is, uh, that's great. We're always open for people adding new functionalities. This package has already developed quite a lot already. Um, so it's a package that's been developed and it's still still growing. So there's always rooms for, for expanding it. The package is built on the framework that we actually published. So a few years back now, we actually published a, a design implementation for a framework for prediction. And that is it pairs up nicely to the package. Although over time, we've actually expanded this framework and we this paper tended to focus on machine learning, but we realized there's actually more aspects to that. So the, the package has also expanded quite a bit past this. So there's three different prediction packages. There's there's two you saw in Hades when Adam was showing um, the, the Hades packages earlier, but there's also a third one that we're about to release. So patient of prediction was the is the base package effectively. It's the package that was was initially developed. I believe Mark and Martin started this in 2015, maybe a little bit earlier. So it's been around for quite some time and we're at version five right now. So you can see that it's, it's a, it's a well-developed package. This actually got broke up, uh, broken up into other packages last year because it was getting too large. So we, we, we split off the ensemble prediction and this recently got released this uh, uh, last few months. And then we're working um, on deep patient prediction that will be releasing really soon. I saw Egg and Henrik are in here. They're actually doing all the hard work for the deep patient health prediction. So you'll see their hard work uh, pay off soon when this gets released. So the base patient health prediction tends to get used by the other packages. So Ensemble PLP is, is, is basically patient health prediction. Um, it depends on that. You, you use your patient health prediction to develop the models. And then the Ensemble PLP just has the functions for combining them. There's actually a lot of area for development in Ensemble PLP. We've got Stacker and Fusion Ensembles right now, but I'm sure there's a lot more Ensembles that could be put in there. So if you're interested in contributing, Ensemble PLP is, is going to be a, an area where you can actually quite easily add things in. And then the Deep Patient or Prediction, right now we're using mostly Torch for that. Um, and again, there's going to be a lot of areas where you can probably contribute into the Deep Patient or Prediction. At the moment, this one just extends PLP. So it uses a lot of the functionalities in PLP um, and then it has, has some additional functionalities. The PLP package is the one I'm going to be focusing on in this talk because this is the base one. This is the one that has all the framework. So this has the code for extracting the data. It has the code for processing the data, fitting the model and evaluating the model. So this is why the other packages tend to use this. The other prediction packages tend to use this. So patient health prediction it's currently passing the R command check, so that's good. And we're up to 89% test coverage now. So for a long time, historically, you would have seen that the code coverage was pretty poor. In the last year, thanks to the um, the, 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 the testathon that Martin set up, we finally got this up past 80%. Um, you can see that there's already a lot of people who've contributed to this package. So as it's been around for a long time, we've got quite a few, but we'll hopefully get more um, after after this session. And if you're interested in looking at the code, it's at github.com forward slash odyssey forward slash patient prediction. Most of the code right now is written in, in R right now, um, although we do have a lot of different backends, which I will talk about. So we actually do have quite a bit of Python in this package and we have some Java as well. So if you go to that GitHub link, the first thing you're going to see is there's just a bunch of folders and files. And there's really five key folders that I wanted to just describe and, and kind of mention so that you can see, see what's in there. So the main folder is the R folder. So if you go to the R folder, you'll see you have lots of files that end in .r. And inside of each of these files, you're going to have all the functions for doing patient health predictions. So there'd be functions for getting the data, there'd be functions for manipulating the data, functions for fitting the model, um, and then 
pretty much everything um, for the MPLP is, is, is in these R, in this R folder. So this is the one you're mainly going to be going into and editing if you want to um, add custom features um, of the, to the package. And then we've also got this test folder. So Adam showed this earlier. In the test folder, you got a test that. And in the test that, you have basically a test. And what we tend to do um, in, in Hades is each of the tests will correspond to an, a, a file in the R folder. So they have the same name, but they'll just be test appended uh, uh, before it. So you can see if you make an edit to a, a, a function in, in a file in the R folder, you should be able to see um, where you have to make the edits in the tests um, in the test folder. We also have inst. So and again, Adam nicely explained what inst, inst does. Inst is, is uh, for PLP, it contains uh, some, some SQL for extracting the data. So if you want to add in or modify slightly the way the data is extracted, uh, for example, if you want to look at health equity and you wanted to have it so that uh, race and ethnicity was being extracted, you could go to that SQL file and you could make some edits to that script um, and, and, and make sure that race and ethnicity is being downloaded into the cohort um, when people extract the data. It's also where we have the Shiny app. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more later um, we've made the Shiny pretty modular, so this is an area where I think people could contribute um, quite a bit for uh, improving that Shiny, especially making tests like JPEG or Jamie was saying earlier. And then the extras folder, this is actually where there's a lot of stuff for, for uh, administration, really, of the package. So you'll see that there's code, for example, to create a website. We use um, a, a package that automatically creates the website for us as long as we have uh, certain files set up and, and they are markdown scripts. Um, we also have things in the extras for updating the, um, the copyright. So you update Smartime created a nice function that updates the copyright uh, year, uh, doing spell checks or things in the package, um, rendering the R markdown. These are all in the extras. So you, you may not have to use this uh, if you're contributing, but if you wanted to, to for example, if you wrote some documentation, then you'd find that there's actually a script in the extras to render that into a PDF, so that may be useful. And then the last one I want to talk about is the vignette folder. So this is where, if you're writing documentation, this is where the R markdown is, is, is safe. So if you go to the vignettes, you'll see a bunch of R markdown files that give you information about uh, running the package and adding custom things. Um, so if you add functionality, if you add something into the R folder, a new function, it, probably you'll need to write some documentation so people know how to actually use that. So the PLP pipeline looks a bit like this. So there's basically two parts. There's extracting the data and then there's running the machine learning effectively and evaluation. So the, the, the main function is get PLP data. That takes in a few settings like what is the database details, what covariates do you want for the patients, and do you have any additional inclusion criteria? And then that will spit out the, the PLP data object. So this contains your target population um, and, and dates when they have the outcome and then their, their covariates. This then, gets put into, uh, this then gets put into the create study population function based on some settings. And the settings that you have to specify is your time at risk and any further inclusion criteria. And that then basically creates a, 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 a list of people um, who, are, who you're interested in, in, in using to develop the model. And also it will have their label, whether they had the outcome or not. And actually it tells you how often they have the outcome. So we're not just doing binary classification. We actually, um, we could use, we could do other types of classification because we have how many times the outcome occurred, which obviously can be put into a binary um, by just saying, is it greater than zero or not? Then the POP data and the population get put into this split data function. And that will then create your test and your train data. And in the test and the train data, we have the labels and we have the covariates for each, each patient. So this is where we get the label data. And in the train data, you also see that, that, that people actually have a fold as well. So we do cross validation to train our model. So um, we just specify basically what, what fold each, each um, patient is in. And then you have a bunch of set, steps for processing the data. So feature engineering, uh, whether you want to oversample, uh, the outcome or undersample the non-outcome, and also any pre-processing like normalization or removing rare features. This is all uh, the next step, and this basically takes training data, spits out a, a manipulated version of the training data, 
And then this then gets put into the fitting model to, to learn your model. So you would specify what model you want to train, whether it's logistic regression, a sport vector machine, or, um, or a neural network. And it will use the train data to then learn your prediction model. Once you've got your prediction model, you can then make predictions on the test and the train data to get your predictions for everyone. Um, and then you can also then evaluate that prediction to basically see how well the, the model um, did. Uh, we also have something where we just have descriptive summaries of, of the data. So that just uses the, the train and the test data uh, to basically just say how often did this feature occur for the different sets. And then finally, when, when you run PLP, the final output is, is a list that has execution settings, the prediction object. So for each person, you have their predicted risk. You have the performance evaluation metrics that tell you how good the model did, like your error under the receiver operating curve, calibration. It also has the model, so you could apply that to new data. And it has this information about the features, so how often were the features um, observed in general. So this is the whole pipeline for PLP. And you'll see that the run PLP is in the run PLP.r file in the R folder. And this is basically the one that tells you how, how everything works. So this is the one that says this is the first step and it goes into the next step. So you, the, the process you just saw is the find in this, in this file. So this is pretty one of the, the main files because this is telling you the structure that's, that's being, being used. You may um, have to modify this if you want major edits. So if you wanted to add something new in, that it wasn't there. Um, I can't think of what would be needed to be added right now, but if, if something came out in the future that we needed an, an extra step, then you would probably have to, to modify that in run PLP. So this would be modified only really for major edits. We've also made it so there's a lot of customization uh, uh, available for, for people. So I showed you that, that, that the, the whole framework of, of, of the run PLP. You actually saw that some of the boxes in here, or the rectangles were shaded into a blue shade. Uh, this basically highlights that this is an area where you can add custom functions. So the POP package has a library of functions for each of these already in it. So if you want to, you can just you can just run the standard functions. But if if, if there was something that you wanted to to do that that wasn't already in the, the POP package, you could write a custom function. Um, and I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of that. It, it, it takes a lot longer to explain fully, but I'll give you a brief overview in the next slide. Um, but effectively, you can specify any way you want to split the, the, the data into your test and train data. So we have methods that will split it by stratified by outcome, and we have methods that will split it based on time. So newer data in the, in the test and older data in the train. Um, but for example, if you wanted to do a split on location, you would need to make sure you, you get the location in the data somehow. So you may have to edit the SQL file that, that downloads the data. But then if you had that location somewhere, you could then create a, a, a custom split that puts location uh, one people in train and location two people in the test. Um, so that's something that you could, you could customize. And you don't have to change the run PLP for this. We've built in the ability to add that customization. So you can quite easily do that yourself. Uh, we have the same idea for feature engineering, for sampling, and for uh, actually fitting the models so for a classifier or survival model. So we've, we've made it pretty flexible um, throughout without having to change the, the main structure of, of the uh, framework. So that's, um, that's, it's quite nice that you can do that. And then although you can do this locally, so you could just create your functions uh, locally and use it yourself, we encourage you to actually add this to the package. So if you add a new classifier that we don't have in our library and the classifier seems to do well for prediction, please make a uh, pull request so that we can add that into the, to the standard library. Uh, the reason that it's, it's good to, to actually add your own functions to the PLP package if you, if you add custom functions is it makes it reproducible for others. If you add custom functions and you don't add it to PLP, then it's a lot harder for people to reproduce because the code is on your computer, not shared for everyone. So if you want to add a new classifier, for example, there is a, an article on the web that tells you how to add custom models and it, it goes through step by step of, of how you do that um, for, for a, a new classifier. We also have uh, every single classifier in PLP 
uh, follows the same structure of this kind of like process to add a new classifier. So you can click on the, the SK Learn classifier settings and the SK Learn classifier.r to see the settings and the fitting functions um, that's been used for, for the, the functions that basically have the Python backend. But uh, effectively what you have is you have this set model where you specify for a classifier the hyperparameters that you want to search. You specify the seed for reproducibility and then you could put in other options. So the set function is mostly saying here's the hyperparameters that I want to investigate when I'm fitting the model. And then in that function, it, it, you need to create this, this list um, of, of basically all the combinations of the hyperparameter settings you want to uh, investigate. Generally, we do a grid search, so that's why uh, you'd have this. And then you need to make sure there are certain attributes to that object, such as the model type to tell you whether you're doing binary um, models or whether you're doing survival models. We only support binary and survival right now in the package, um, but in the future that could grow to, to multi-class if, if we add in the evaluations. Um, so you need to specify model type, you need to specify a save type. So this is basically how the model is going to get saved. Um, right now, we encourage people saving models as JSON. Um, so uh, I'm going to, in this example, it uses the R to JSON saving. And then um, you need to have finally an output that has the fit function. And this basically specifies what function will be called uh, to actually train the, the, the classifier. And here we're basically going to have the code for doing the model fitting. But you need to specify it in the, the set model basically needs to specify the fit function um, in, in what's returned and also the, the, the parameter, which is this, this combination of all the hyperparameter settings that you want to search. Um, and this has to be a class model setting. So as long as you have this type of input and your output is correct like this, um, this is going to fit into the package well. It can be kind of overwhelming in terms of knowing what things you need to add. Um, if you don't add these correctly, it, it could break if you're trying to test it. So if you do end up in a situation where you're adding a custom classifier and for some reason it's not working, just, just send me an email or post on the GitHub um, and, and I can help with that because it, it probably is just missing some sort of attribute um, and there's no point spending hours and days trying to figure that out when I can probably point you to that pretty quickly. And then the fit function basically has to have the standard input of it takes the train data. So if you're trying to fit a model, you always need the label data. Then it takes the pram, which is effectively this this part here that you've put into the setting. So in PLP under under the scenes, it's basically taking this param and putting it into here. And then it's got a few other inputs that aren't really necessarily always needed. And then this fit function is basically going to do whatever it does to learn that model. And then you do have to have a standard output. So you have to have a list that contains a model, a prediction object, a settings, a train details, and a coup very important. And this class has to be class PLP model. And you have to have an attribute of prediction function to know uh, what prediction function you should be calling when you when you um, apply this to make predictions. So this is the standard input and output for the fit model. And if you want to add a new classifier, effectively you just need to, to follow this structure. We have the same sort of idea of the feature engineering. You're going to have a setting function and a fitting function. And then again, there's the inputs to the set function is the inputs that are needed when you're doing the feature engineering. And you need to specify the function. Basically, it's the function that's going to be called to do the feature engineering. And then the feature engineering function takes the train data, takes the set is effectively this, and then does whatever it does to add in new features spits out the training data. So we, you, you can add whatever uh, process you want to do for feature engineering into the package using these two functions. So uh, PLP, um, patient prediction, the front end is obviously R, and most of the code is written in R, but you'll actually see that a lot of the code that we have um, is, is actually done from Python, C++, or Java. Um, so the uh, psychic learn stuff, um, so our Ada Boost, our random forest, our decision tree, um, and a few other classifiers, support vector machine, and so on, neural network, these all use the psychic learn package in Python. Um, we also have, like, I believe the Cyclops, which Mark's going to be talking about next, um, I believe that's mostly C, but I, I may be wrong with that. And then the big KNN is Java. So we actually have a lot of different languages. Um, that we're interacting with. 
And effectively, you can use any language as long as there is some R interface. So Java, there's R Java, C++ is a natural um, language to be able to plug into R. And then Python, we've got the reticulate package. So I'm just going to talk about the reticulate package. So for those of you who do Python and you want to contribute to this package, um, there's a lot of opportunity for you to do that. We have um, the reticulate is what we use. We, we restructured so that we actually write most things in R with the Python kind of reticulate functions. So um, it looks like R, but it's actually pretty much Python. And reticulate has made it very easy to set up a Python environment for people as well. So this has kind of been pretty nice. Um, it's got better over time. We have functions in patient level prediction that will set up a Python environment using Miniconda. Um, and it, it currently installs all the Python dependencies like NumPy and Scikit-Learn um, that are required um, for the user. If you do add some new Python code, you do need to make sure that any Python library that is a dependency is basically um, put into the Python setup function so that when people set up their Python, they have everything that they need to, to run whatever custom code you, you, you've written. So how do you contribute? So if you have a new feature um, or, or something that you want to add, the, the, the process that we've been kind of developing and it seems to be working well is to first basically post an issue. So if you go to the patient prediction GitHub issues um, and, you, and you post some, an issue and you explain what it is you want to do. Um, and, and ideally, my tip would be to tag people like myself or other people who are, who are contributing to the package to get attention. Um, if you tag it, they should get an email that says this person has is, is, is kind of made a, a, an issue um, and then they can read it and see, see what's going on. And the reason for this is just to get a discussion. So you may have uh, a current plan for how you want to uh, approach it, but there may be other people who have been thinking similar sort of ideas and maybe they've got a slightly different plan. So you can just have a chat and basically come to a consensus of how you want to tackle this so that if you do the code, um, you don't end up in a situation where someone else is doing similar code and we've got to try and pick who, how, how, we, how we address that. Um, or maybe someone says we should be doing it this way. Uh, before, you, before you kind of get to that step, just get a consensus first and then you can start working on the code and you know that everyone's going to be happy and it can be pulled in. So that's going to be that's basically the current step. So anything I want to add, I post it onto this issues and I get feedback from people first before I start working on it. And then once you've got this kind of consensus, um, then what you want to do is you want to create a new branch off of develop and name it based on the issue number that you got in one. So if you post an issue and your issue was 23, um, create a new branch called issue 23. You may have to fork this and then um, if you're forking, you, you won't have the ability, uh, you know, not everyone can have the ability to create a branch. If you're forking, it's different. Um, but if you're able to create a branch, this is what you want to do. And then um, add your new code. Once you've added your code, you will need to add tests. So you need to go to the test, test that. And you need to make sure that at least 80% of that new lines in your, new, in your code are covered by tests. So we can maintain this a, great, a greater than 80% test coverage. And you need to make sure that the R command check uh, passes. So Adam showed you earlier how you can do that. You need to run that for the package and make sure that there isn't anything that, that's broken. You need to make sure that the dependencies are all, all um, kind of specified correctly in the, in the description and such. So once you've got the pass and the command check and you've got the test coverage is, is greater than or equal to 80% for your new code, uh, you're at the point then you can make a pull request from your either branch or your fork into the developer branch and that's pretty much your job done at that point um, obviously if you want to add more features that's great as well but then what would happen is after that one of the maintainers will then review the code and they look to see um, what changes were made and if, 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 if it's all good then they'll be able to pull that in um, oh one thing I do want to note when you're making a pull request make sure that the changes um, are, are specific to just the, the, the functions that you've added or modified. Um, I've had it in the past where people have, for some reason, got space changes throughout the whole package, and then GitHub sees that as a change, and it basically, um, the, 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 the pull request has 20 different files that have changes, um, and really it was only like five lines of code that were, were really modified, but I've had to review through um, a lot of files. 
So when you do it, please make sure that the only changes in the code that you actually make a pull request for are the changes that you've added. So it makes it a lot easier to read. Otherwise, I'm probably going to send it back, or whoever's reviewing it is probably going to send it back and ask you um, to basically get rid of some of the stuff that's not actual real changes. Um, if the maintainer doesn't see any issues, like he or she will pull the in to develop. If there are some, some, some potential issues, you'll get some comments and suggested revisions. And once you've made those changes, it will then get pulled in. And then once uh, it's pulled into develop, the maintainer will then be able to update the news and the description, um, the version number of description in the website. So these, the things like that um, will, will get modified by the maintainer. And then at regular intervals, we're going to have the uh, develop branch pulled into the, the main, and that's when the package will get released. And, and all these cool features that you're added uh, will be available to people using the, the release version. So this is the process that we've currently um, started to, to take for adding features. One thing as well that I want to point out is we have a Shiny app. So in the in Shiny PLP viewer, um, you'll see this structure. We revised it the last few months to a year ago, some point in the last year, uh, to make it modular. So every tab in the Shiny view basically has an R folder, uh, sorry, an R file in the modules folder. And um, the good thing of this, it makes it a lot easier now if you want to debug or add things. So you should be able to see quite clearly if you want to add something, for example, into the discrimination tab, you can go to discrimination.r and, and modify that. Um, and so, so it should make it a lot easier to, to add and contribute for the Shiny. Um, another easy place if you want to make contributions to the PLP package is to add tests. So similar to what Jamie was saying earlier, um, we need tests for all of our code. We don't have any Shiny tests right now for PLP for the Shiny app. So if you're interested in the Shiny and you're interested in, in, in testing, um, that would be fantastic if you wanted to contribute to that. One thing that I found that we struggled a little bit um, and I haven't done very well is communicating um, how what, what we're working on in the package um, and where we see the future growth of PLP. So to address that, I started to think about trying to use the projects in GitHub. Um, the reason I picked this is just because I don't like to have lots of different um, links for things. I want to have everything in one place. So it's nice we've got the GitHub has the code, it has the issues, it also has this button for projects. So it seems like it's all in one place, which should be a lot easier to remember. Um, but we haven't really tested this too much. So we may have to, if this doesn't work too well or it doesn't get used, we may have to look at other solutions. But for now, we're testing the idea of uh, using this GitHub pro pro project as a way to show what bug fixes we're working on and also to show plan improvements, so future developments for PLP. And it looks like this. So the GitHub projects, uh, effectively, you can see you've, if you go to the GitHub, the code is where you normally go to, issues is where you go if you want to say, here's a new feature or here's a bug, pull requests is if you want to see what, what, what pull requests people have made. Um, and then this project is kind of like far over to the right over here. Um, so if I look at the plan improvements of PLP, we can see that there's you can list, uh, you can put, you can basically categorize things into in progress, needs review, review approved, and these can be pulled in through the issues. So if someone makes an issue, I can kind of pull it in here and say, okay, this needs review and assign it to people. Um, or we can say this is being approved and it's here, or you can say this is in progress. So this should be a way for people to see what we're working on and, and how far it's progressed. Is it, is it an idea? Is it something that we said, yeah, this seems good? Or is it something that we're actively working on? So um, the aim is to try and use this to just communicate more how we're actually growing um, and things that we're working on. And you can see actually, if you make a suggestion, whereabouts it is in the progress. If you've made a suggestion, you're, you're gonna be contributing, add it here and say it's in progress. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, I think there's like a few minutes before uh, Mark's due. And then um, also got some interesting links here. So if you're interested in looking at the code, here's the link. If you're interested in the issues, um, you can go to the, the, the issues. And if you're interested in looking at the website, this is where there's a lot of documentation. So if you wanna look at the R Markdown um, for, oh, sorry, not the, the actual rendered R Markdown for the, the 
creating custom features or feature engineering or any of the other customization, that's all on the website in the documentation. But I think if, if, if anyone has any questions, we have like a minute, otherwise I will hand the floor over to Mark. Thanks a lot, Jenna. That was fantastic. Um, does anyone have questions for Jenna? I do, but I'm going to save them because they're <laughs> because they're extensive. <laughs> we're 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 working on adding a couple of new models to to PLP, so it's making the right connections. This is very helpful, Jenna. Well, I'm always happy to hear more more being added, so that's I'm happy to chat anytime. <laughs>